Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we're talking commodity indexes. What are they? How are they constructed? How do they generate value? What's the history of them? And who is investing in them? And are the current commodity indexes relevant and fit for a world of energy transition? Our guests are Tim Kramer. Tim's a founder of CNIC, which has launched a carbon neutral power index in conjunction with ICE. Also joining us is Preston Peacock. Preston is the head of index products at ICE, Data Indices. He's had 25 years working on creating indexes. And JC Neal, whose career with ICE has been focused on the exchange side, working on natural gas, power, and NGLs. As always, you can support the show by leaving us a positive review on the platform you're listening on. Okay, great. So, so Tim, Preston, JC, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So we're talking commodity indexes, the history of them, the current state of them, the future, which ties in the new products you guys have been collaborating on. Let's start, Tim, with you. What is a what is the history of the the commodity index? Let's let's start there. Sure. So prior to 1970, there were a few commodity indexes, but they were primarily physical commodity indexes, and they were developed by Reuters, FT, and The Economist. There were a couple of financial commodity indexes by Dow Jones and the CRB, but all they really had in them was like front month contracts, and it was on just a few general generic commodities. And these indexes at the time, they were not investable, so they couldn't be replicated by any financial investor because the data wasn't really available because of technology. And so they were just kind of there tracking things, but there wasn't really much you could do with them. And so these came out around the same time that you had um, stock market indexes, again, back in the 70s. And so nothing really occurred then until 1978, when the Journal of Portfolio Management published a paper called Conservative Commodities, a Key Inflation Hedge by a guy named Robert Greer. And so what this actually did is it took the CPI and it mapped the different commodities to the different components of the CPI and then figured out how to weight them correctly so that this would give you a reflection of what was going on in the the CPI. At the time, there was very minimal interest in that particular article or in commodities in general. And there were still no financial instruments for investment purposes. And the reason it just didn't, nobody paid attention to it, didn't catch on, was still back in the the mid to late 70s, commodities were viewed as being risky. And they were viewed as being risky because of the inherent leverage involved, where you put down a little bit of margin or collateral and can control a large amount of the underlying. And they were also viewed as confusing derivatives because they thought that, you know, the, the general public at the time thought that futures meant that you were owning the underlying. So that paper came out and the index was created, but nothing happened from 1978 until about 1991. And around the time of 1991, Goldman came out with the GSCI, the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index. And that had about 24 different commodities in that with different weights. They did that as a bespoke product for some of their uh, larger customers. And so there really wasn't anything commercially available. And there's not a whole lot of data about what they were doing with it. So then the next thing that you have, the next time commodities kind of popped up and and did something notable was 1993, there was an individual named Frank Russell who wrote a paper talking about the importance of commodities in an overall portfolio. And that was for inflation protection and portfolio diversification. And when he wrote that paper, then you had Bankers Trust come out with the Bankers Trust Commodity Index. Merrill Lynch came out with a commodity index, JP Morgan, et cetera. So that was in 93. And that was the start of when the indexes themselves started to appear. So initially, we essentially just had indexes that were just tracking a a basket of commodities price linked to the the consumer price index. But this is also at the time as well, kind of as you alluded to, 70s, early 80s. I mean, derivatives weren't yet sort of widely understood, prevalent in the market as well. So there was market developments coming as well that allowed Goldman's indeed to create the GSCI, right? Just to just to get an understanding of the 
that piece. Right. That's exactly right. So they, and the other thing too, is you didn't really have readily available data. So if you wanted to track what was going on for the underlying commodities, it's not like you had screens available and you could see where the prices on the underlying 24 commodities were moving at the time. So for what you talked about, these things were just there and they were just tracking plus the data issue. They were there, but there was nothing really going on with them. So, so what what essentially happens is both a, a growing public awareness of the the importance of commodities not only in in industry but actually as a as a, uh, a a part of a portfolio construction as well as the derivative tools and actually enabling these products to, to be developed themselves um so so we've transitioned towards these investable products how were they developed and and how were they initially received in 1998 oppenheimer came out with what was called the real asset fund and it was a closed end fund and it was actually benchmarked against the gsci so that's the first readily available publicly available product that you can find that's linked to a commodity index and around then the year 2000 if you take a look these things started to grow um, pretty strongly where you had about 10 billion dollars by the year 2000 that was benchmarked to a whole handful of different commodity indexes and this just goes back to the traditional asset allocation model which the, the paper from Frank Russell in 93 talked about the need for portfolio diversification and inflation protection. And so the big investors in the early part of this were the pensions and endowments. So the first ones of note that pop up would be Harvard Endowment, Ontario Teachers Pension, and the Singapore government. So they were the ones that were doing this originally. And then in 2002, PIMCO created one of the first commodity mutual funds. And so what they did with this was they took a commodity index and they benchmarked to it and they allowed themselves a little bit of discretion. So the commodities that are in the index, PIMCO could underweight or overweight within certain guardrails. But then PIMCO is primarily a fixed income shop and that's where their expertise is. So they were able to work on adding incremental returns by actively managing the fixed income collateral piece of that. So that's kind of the first like readily available product that popped up and that was around 2000. And that got a lot of attention and a lot of traction so that by 2008, you had approximately $300 billion that were invested in commodity funds, ETFs, separately managed accounts, et cetera. And some of the reasons that this started to become popular was during that time period from you know, 2000 to 2008 when, these, when commodity indexes were growing, the S&P, the return during that period was probably about minus 6% on an annualized basis, whereas commodity indexes were probably up about 6% on an annualized basis. So just the fact that it was a positive return and then the fact that it kind of offset what was going on in the S&P helped to generate interest in this. And then at the time, too, you had inflation, which averaged during that time period about two and a half percent. And so that started to give people thought process, OK, for inflation protection, didn't somebody write some articles? Maybe we should go back and take a look at that. And so that's kind of what got more attention to this. And then you fast forward now to the end of 22, where there's approximately one point six trillion dollars, which is directly and indirectly associated with these commodity indexes. So some of the bigger ones have just you know a massive amount of money. And then some of the smaller ones, and, and there's some bespoke products that also have certain amounts that make this thing measurable. But what you actually have them when we talk about directly and indirectly, the direct products, you can find that there, there's two flavors of that. There's passive and active. So the passive products will say that they are trying to exactly replicate whatever that commodity index is. And then the active ones just use it as a benchmark and try to beat it. So that's the direct. And then the indirect, you've got products like there's total return bond funds with the stated goal of trying to beat inflation. And when you look through the documents, prospectuses on that, they are actually allocated to commodities. You've got some diversified income funds that do allocation to commodities also. And those things don't really pop up on the regular screens. So you went from almost nothing in 98, 2000 to about 1.6 trillion today in commodity funds. Yeah. And I want to also talk toward the end of this conversation about their their then impact, the sort of Heisenberg uncertainty principle of these funds on the markets themselves. So I think that's interesting. But I guess before we go, that's a great setup, Tim, on the evolution in history and now the scale of commodity indexes. And we've had a previous episode on whether commodities really is a true hedge for inflation, but separate discussion. But Preston, maybe we can turn to you as someone who's been building indices for a long time. You know, 
what are the basic components of a commodity index? Just help us understand. Sure. Yeah. Let me just say at the outset that ICE is here just for information purposes only, I and mean, we don't recommend any investment or uh, investment strategies. But from an index perspective, I mean, it, it always boils down to the same basic principles. Uh, what is it that we're attempting to track? And uh, then how are you going about tracking it? So that's the, the big overarching angle here. And that's the same for, for anything, anything you're attempting to index. Uh, indexing simply means that we're trying to track some market or a segment of a market. So uh, obviously the ways in which you go about doing that is gonna depend on, on the nature of the thing you're trying to track. And in this case, uh, we're talking about commodity futures contracts. So uh, by and large, we're tracking uh, individual contracts and you know we have indexes that would track a single contract uh, or a group of contracts in a certain sector, agriculture, or energy, or et cetera. But it, it, I think for purposes of our discussion, we can talk about you know high level, what does it mean to track uh, the commodities futures market as a whole? And that typically starts out by having some qualification criteria around the, the contracts that you're looking at. And the key starting point for that is typically liquidity, because if you can't see it, you can't value it, then it, it, everything else is beside the point. You can't track it if you, if you can't get uh, reliable pricing in a relatively liquid market. So liquidity is obviously relative. So we, we try to quantify a threshold that would qualify a contract for inclusion. So that's kind of the starting point. And then once you have the, 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 the commodities and, and its associated contracts that you uh, are looking at to include in an index, then the next question is, well, how do you weight those things? Which is not uh, an obvious thing because, well, what does it mean in terms of oil or copper or, or what have you? What, what is the weighting factor that we, you would use if you want some kind of a relative size component? The way that index providers have typically answered that is to look at a global production value. So what you look at is how much of a commodity is being produced on, uh, say, an annual basis. And there are agencies and organizations that produce these statistics. And you would then use that as your weighting factor for the contract representing, say, uh, uh, crude oil or copper for inclusion in your index. Now. That sounds you know, simple in principle, but there's actually other complicating factors. For one thing, it's, it is not easy or straightforward to actually get a handle on global production. I say that there, uh, there are organizations that produce these figures, but that they're typically produced on a lag basis because it is very hard to, to actually find out everything that is being produced. The other thing that index providers have to deal with is overlap, for example, on the oil side, uh, how much is actually going into gasoline uh, versus heating oil? And on, on the feedstocks and grains, and you have uh, you know food versus livestock, et cetera. So there are many kind of uh, overlap uh, considerations. All of that has to be backed out. So you're getting, uh, you're not double counting that global production value. So at the end of the day, you typically get um, to those values. And then the next question is, well, how are you reweighting that? Um, how often is that weighting going to change? Uh, many index providers would go through that exercise on an annual basis, um, because as I mentioned, that this information is not real time, uh, quite the contrary, and it's available at best on an annual basis. And sometimes there is uh, two or three years lag in, in some of this, this reported information. So an annual reset of those global production values, usually using a trailing period, an average of a trailing period production value is what is employed. Now, the other thing that you have to deal with in a futures index is the role. All right, so you've chosen your, your commodities, uh, the contracts that you're gonna consider for conclusion. You understand how to weight them now, but you have to choose which expiry you're going to use and how frequently you're going to roll that. And it's a critical decision. And in many cases, it's relatively obvious based on the trading volume. So you would look at how much of a contract it typically trades, uh, three months out, six months out. When does that uh, liquidity tend to start to fade? 
Are you going to then roll into the, the next contract on a monthly basis? Or um, in some cases, you just buy a year out and hold on to it and roll it once a year. So it very much depends on the, the nature of the, the trading for each commodity contract that you're looking at. So that's, um, that's also kind of critical to the decision making for the index methodology. Thanks for that, Preston. So, so what you know, there's just looking at the the, the shared notes we all have because there's obviously a lot to cover on this, and it's quite complex. Is you know, what are the sort of the the, the key factors for success of a commodities index? Well, I think um, a, a clear and consistent methodology is critical. Everything I described, it's incumbent upon the index provider to be very clear about you know how all of the contracts get included, how they're weighted, how they're rebalanced. All of that has to be very clearly specified. And then of course, the other part of it is in terms of the calculation, you have to to be able to do the calculations correctly, which may sound simple, but there are, uh, as you probably guessed by now, there are complexities. The contracts that we're talking about are exchange listed. So there is a, uh, there's an intraday uh, market, of course, and then there is the the closing or or settlement uh, levels. Now, if you look at the calculation of the return, uh, over time, then there's a, a few different elements that that play into this. Obviously, you calculate the change in the price and that you can get a, a total return. Now, that is true here too, but there are a few different elements that you have to take into consideration. One is collateral because the futures market works on a, a margin model. So uh, essentially, you put up some collateral in order to be able to to purchase contracts, and then that margin may change uh, over time. Index providers have have uh, traditionally assumed a 100% collateral for purposes of of the index. Uh, in, in reality, you could potentially get away with a lot less than that, uh, maybe five percent or, or or less in some cases, but you would be subject to potential margin calls. So we assume uh, in the index that 100% of the value is collateralized and that uh, the the standard is to use a AT bill um, that you will earn some interest on as uh, you're holding that collateral. So that becomes a part of the, the return calculation. But the other thing is understanding where the return is coming from, because remember, uh, you know, with futures contracts, you're, you're not actually buying a, a thing today. You're actually buying a something that uh, you're, you may get in the future based on the expiry. So you're buying X uh, amount of a commodity that, that to be delivered, say, three or six months in the future. So there's this uh, a concept of spot return versus roll return. Now, the spot is, is essentially you can calculate that implied every day. Uh, based on the nature of the the curve itself. So what is the price uh, for uh, the contract that is expiring next month or next week versus one that's three months or six months down the road? The change in that uh, that curve itself will change over time. But one thing you can be sure of is that part of the the price change today uh, versus yesterday has to do with you're closer to expiry, you're closer to uh, the spot market. And the spot market is somewhat theoretical in that you can't simply go out and um, and trade that around uh, physically. So it's a it's a way to understand how much of the performance is due to the fact that you're closer to expert, this role uh, component, versus how much has to do with the fact that, hey, the market was up or the market was down. So all of that gets included as a part of the return and there's also the notion in the commodity space of excess return, which simply means that I'm backing out the impact of the treasury collateral. And then if you com- compare the spot return versus the excess return, you can get to uh, the roll return. So there are ways to really understand not just the index itself, uh, but part of what an index always does is to bring transparency to the markets and the market dynamics themselves. Right. So spot yield and, and roll yield, the other two components are collateral yield and rebalancing yield. Can you just talk to those, Preston, and then we'll, we'll, we'll come on to why it's not always, you know, why people are investing in these and why it doesn't always work out. But yeah, can you just talk to those two, two uh, facets as well? 
Sure. Well, the collateral yield I you know, spoke to, you know, that's really the collateral being invested, uh, the assumption being in, in short T bills. Right. So your that that part of the return is embedded in the total return of the index. Uh, the rebalancing is a little more subtle, um, and this has to do with with we set said at the outset in the construction methodology for the index that you you are resetting those weights on a regular basis. They're floating uh, on um, uh, the the interperiod. So uh, if you're resetting to these weights on an annual basis, well then how much change, how much return impact is that uh, compared to on a resetting to those target weights, if you will, on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis. So there is a, there's certainly an, an impact there, but there's also uh, the cost. So the rebalancing yield, if you will, has to do with how much of the, the index return has to do with alternative uh, rebalancing or resetting of the weights. Right. Okay. So thanks for that. So I guess we're going to, I'm going to come back to who's actually investing these, in these and why and how it fits into portfolio theory in a minute. But let's just staying sort of on the, the nature of indexes themselves. What are the typical pros and cons of any any commodity index? Well, in talking about pros and cons relative to an index, it, it really has to do with what you're trying to track. So an index is, uh, is really only as good as it is a good indicator for what it's trying to, to track. So if you're, you're setting out to measure uh, something like just the, the price of, of, of gold, then what is the best proxy for actually getting to that, whether it's a futures contract or you're, you've got the settlement price uh, at an auction? Uh, there are ways of going about that. There are pros and cons associated with that. But the, if you're, you're talking about a broad commodity index, then the the issue of the question in mind is how how successfully are you capturing the depth and breadth of that market um, and is someone going to look at it and say well yeah that makes sense uh, we think this does broadly track this and that's where I think that there are potentially uh, some interesting uh, angles to take and where we need to continually evolve the notion of what it is that we're trying to track in a broad global commodity index. Uh, because it, it has grown over time, as and I think as Tim pointed out earlier, from being just something that has narrow interests and focus to, to one now that is taken as, a, as a, an indicator of uh, many different things. One, of course, the overall commodity space uh, in the financial markets, but also as important indicators for things like inflation. These are all inputs to the broader economy and, and, and industrial activity. So, you know, pass through inflation um, indicators, uh, it, it would be an obvious uh, way to understand what a commodity index may be telling you. And then there's there's the broader economic impacts of all of that. So uh, in, in some cases, some commodities are, are, are key indicators to an uptick in, in activity around a certain uh, economic sector. So how well an index can do at uh, performing these kind of goals, which is somewhat research, but also a very in a very real way representing um, a, a broad base that uh, commodities inhabit in the global economy. Now, on the con side, that's... Uh, a little tricky, and I, th I think you know we talked about how appropriate it is for 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 what it's trying to measure, but it's also, and Tim also mentioned this earlier, is it's it's a difficult concept, I think, as a derivative, to square away with exactly what it is uh, in a in a kind of physical or tangible material way. You're talking about a contract to uh, purchase something at some point in the future, so as a derivative. You've got all of these things embedded in, in, in the pricing and the price change. So it's not as simple as saying, well, X, Y, or Z went up or down. Yes, it, it, you can say that to some degree, but only with a caveat that, well, the future price of that thing <laughs> went up or down. And how does that relate to where we are now um, and start to tear uh, into all of that? The other thing I would say is we talked about the inflation part of this. And, 
Um, the fact that in, in some in some ways, there's no reason outside of, uh, of inflation or, or basic supply demand that these things would uh, necessarily always go up. And this is a little bit of a, a difficult concept for someone not in the financial market said, so maybe the casual investor uh, or, or a private individual, well, stocks and bonds, you know, they you, stocks, you know, typically go up. Well, there are many reasons why they may do that. Hopefully, they're earning more money. And bonds, well, they pay a, a certain amount of interest. And, and But here, it's a little bit of a different story. So there's this, I think, information gap about understanding what are the dynamics that are going on here, where there's a lot of education, I think, that has to go on. Right. And I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you've raised that because obviously I clearly need some more education on this. But I think a useful way of perhaps doing it is to say, in the context of spot roll collateral rebalancing yield, what are, what would be sort of the ultimate market condition for me to to achieve all my objectives? Right. So, is oil price going up? Is it in Katanga? Is it what, what you know? It, and it, it, my my T bills that my you know, the collateral T bills are yielding five six percent. All these things. Like what, what at what point in an economy in a commodities market do commodity indexes absolutely start flying? Well, I think that's a really interesting question, and and I'm going to put it back a little bit to, to Preston and maybe even Tim, because the reality of it is, is it depends on the index construction. I can create indices of a variety of different formulas and valuations, and some can have returns when commodity prices go up. Some indices can have returns when commodity prices go down. Again, further to what Preston was saying about construct, et cetera, it really depends on the index creator taking time to identify the strategic reasons that somebody would want to use this particular index for this particular commodity. So if we wanted to choose something like gasoline, you know, something we all use every single day, it's highly probable that the average consumer, the average individual investor out there thinks of it more along the lines of a stock and says, gosh, I think there will be more demand for gasoline in the coming year. And how do I get exposure to that particular commodity? Well, they could certainly go out and buy individual future shares of, of Arbob on ICE or some other futures exchange. But then there's also the more direct route of most people are just going to call their broker or their financial consultant and say, hey, how do I do this? And they may recommend uh, a, an in particular equity, uh, some sort of stock uh, of a large gasoline producer. But more and more lately, what we've seen is that people will say, hey, well, have you heard about such and such ETF? And the point of those ETFs is that they use commodity indices to provide returns in what seems to be a more transparent and more direct way to the underlying thing that the consumer or investor is truly trying to invest in. For instance, if I want to invest in gasoline, I could go buy a gasoline producer, but then I have to take into account all the things that go with making gasoline. Do they do a good job running their business? Are they paying a dividend? How is it affecting their share price? How is it affecting equity price? Whereas if I'm buying an ETF that is specifically correlated to the gasoline, it's possible and hopefully probable, depending on the index construct, that I'm simply buying something that should go up when gasoline goes up, and it may go down when gasoline goes down. The HC Insider podcast is brought to you by HC Group, a retained search, intelligence, and advisory firm focused solely on the global energy and commodity sector. With six locations across Asia, Europe, and the Americas, and over 50 consultants. To find out more, go to our website, hcgroup.global. There, you can also sign up for our HC Insider content for more interviews and white papers on relevant trends and talent impacts in the commodities world. You mentioned at the start there, Tim, about this sort of this ten, the, the scale of money that has flowed into commodity indexes. You know, one point six trillion in twenty twenty two. Can you just tie that? Like, who who actually are the major drivers of that? And sure. So you have what we'll say uh, a few different categories of investors in commodity indexes. So it's pensions and endowments, family offices, mutual funds, and then we'll say hedge funds. So with respect to pensions and endowments, they're looking for inflation protection and portfolio diversification. 
So you can run the screens on the top pensions, top endowments, et cetera, and see what they have. So the endowments typically run about three to 5% in terms of their allocation to commodities. And you can get this off the screen in the individual ones, or in 2020, there was a paper, uh, some research that was done by the National Association of College and University Business Offices. They said pretty much the same thing. The average was about 2.2% and the max was about 20% for commodity allocation. With pensions, can they kind of fall in the same bucket? Do the screen, see what they own. The National Conference of Public Employee Retirement put out a paper in 21 that said the median for pensions was about 3.3% to commodities and the max was about 15%. Now, those are ranges. And so kind of back to your point about, you know, who would invest and why in this and what are you trying to accomplish? During the 2010 to 2020 period, that's kind of when commodities had their downturn. And so most commodity indexes during that time period from 10 to 20 were down kind of like an average of about 5% a year. And so the, the reason these pensions and endowments went into it, you know, they talk about inflation protection and portfolio diversification. So as these returns are down, they're like, well, it's okay if it's down, we're in it for inflation protection. And then it continues to be down and they go, well, we've got diversification. But after a significant period of, of negative returns, they spit the hook out. They said, we had enough of this and they just get rid of it. <laughs> and so that's kind of what happened is uh, during that time period from 2010 to 2020, you can actually see the pensions and endowments ratchet down their exposure. So where they were holding like, you know, we'll say three to 5% for the range there, they went down from like, to like zero to 3%. And of course, everything looks, you know, most bid at the top and most offered at the bottom. As soon as they reduce their holdings, you had the return start to ramp up. So in 21 to today, the commodity indexes are generically up about, we'll say 16% a year during that time period, where the S&P is down about 15%. So now the commodities are, are kind of coming back in vogue because of what you're seeing with inflation and what the overall returns are. So you're seeing those pensions and endowments come back in. The second group that kind of puts money into this are family offices, and they do it again for portfolio diversification. I got to say, I was kind of surprised at the the depth and breadth and scope of these family offices in terms of like how many they are and what the AUM is. It, it's it's kind of staggering. And so the family offices aren't as encumbered as the pensions and endowments. They can move more quickly because they don't have the investment committees and other things that they need to work through. And so the, the top 50 family offices in the US average about 5 billion per family office for AUM. And they, to, they tend to hold about 5% in commodities with the max being about seven and a half percent. And that's from a report that UBS put out in conjunction with a company called Camden Wealth. The third group that tends to invest in this would be mutual funds. And they tend to do this, you know, as an outright product, but they'll also do something what's called inclusion in a model portfolio. So for instance, you'll have model portfolios that say, okay, 60, 40 for equity to debt. And then sometimes they'll switch that and say, okay, 60, 35, five. So they'll say 60 equity, 35 debt, and then five in commodities. And so kind of an example of how that's just almost the holy grail, if you can get allocation into that, would be Vanguard had uh, a product that they put out recently, I was saying like maybe three or four years ago. And they started it with, I think, less than $100 million. And they put it into their model portfolio. And that thing is you know over $2 billion today. So you've got that for the, the mutual fund flavor, the model portfolio flavor, plus there's you know, some real return funds, balanced funds, inflation protection funds that'll have anywhere from, you know, we'll say five to, to 25% that are also allocated to commodities. And then the last group that tends to use these commodity indexes to express views would be hedge funds. And so the best thing that you can look at right now would be natural gas is you know, the, the price has gone almost straight down since the beginning of the year. I think you went below $2 today. But if you take a look at the fund flows into the natural gas ETFs, they've gone nothing but up. So you, you've had over $3 billion in the past, we'll say eight weeks, flowing into these natural gas ETFs because the hedge funds use that as a way to express their view on the underlying commodity. And then you've got people that'll try to arb out the individual commodities versus the indexes. So that's kind of the flavor of the investors in terms of pensions and endowments, family offices, the mutual funds and the hedge funds. Yeah. Well, where does the individual investor buying, you know, an ETF, you know, various construction in commodity indexes? I mean, where, what's their role in this in terms of scale and scope? So you'll see that expressed more in terms of the model portfolios and what you've got for the RIAs recommending that these guys do. 
And you may have somebody taking an individual view to express what they're doing, but the, the predominant investors in this are more like the pensions and endowments and family offices. Yeah. Okay. Before we move on to where the gaps are and, there, and therefore the, the product that you'd be working on, is there any sense, Preston, to you, have have the as as indexes roll or as investable products have grown, have they changed in any way how the markets themselves function, how they operate? I mean, what is this? What has been the consequent impact on the derivatives markets for these commodities as you get these huge inflows into into indexes and rolls and all this kind of stuff? Well, I, I can take the first part of it. I think you know um, JC could talk probably a little bit more about you know the impact on the uh, on the trading and market side. But, you know, I think quite clearly, and we've seen this, uh, you know, on the equity side and then uh, the fixed income side, the amount of, of passive investment through uh, the ETF vehicle is, has certainly changed the trading dynamics. Um, it's increased uh, liquidity in many ways, uh, not just necessarily in the underlying. For example, the fixed income markets still trade OTC. Um, it's not necessarily as any uh, easier necessarily to get the cash bonds, for example, uh, that, that are embedded inside the ETFs and, and the indexes they're based on. But it, it has increased uh, price discovery quite quite significantly. And of course, uh, the most important thing is uh, has reduced cost and fees associated with getting investors exposed to uh, segments of the market. So. I would imagine that uh, the same dynamics are continuing to play out on the commodity side as well. But uh, JC, you comment on that. Thanks. Uh, this is a really interesting question is how do all these inflows really affect the underlying markets? And, and the bottom line is that there is some measurable effect to liquidity. There are folks that both are buying into ETFs, getting out of ETFs. These create creations and redemptions for the ETFs. These create opportunities for all sorts of participants to estimate impacts on the underlying commodity or rather estimate trading behavior in the underlying commodity. Certainly, as both Tim and Preston have mentioned, you have very well-structured and well-known role periods for ETFs and, and index funds. And so certainly there are folks, investors, speculators, hedgers, out there that will do their best to participate in the market when they know certain events like that are showing up. So generally speaking, we see ETFs and other investment vehicles that are related to a commodity as being positive for total liquidity to those commodities. And Paul, that's a great question because when the original indexes first came out, one of the critiques on those things was that you are, because they're long only, you're driving up the price of key important commodities like wheat for people to make bread and gasoline for them to drive their cars. And so there was an initial pushback, but the response was, no, you're actually providing liquidity because you tend to have the producers that are looking for some sort of an investment vehicle to hedge their underlying exposure. And so by giving them that liquidity, they're able to do more things in terms of deploying capital. So they quickly got past that in terms of the, the index is being bad for the overall economy and it said just liquidity it provides to the underlying and the price discovery is actually a good thing i may be naive here though but you essentially within an index have an algorithm right a key set of rules that you have to follow does that not for traders give them a playbook to which they can you know uh, we just recently did an episode i know it was a long time ago on metal gazelle shaft but you know essentially it was one of the insiders knew what was going on and were able to you know trade against it i mean when you get to the end of the month and these contracts are up for expiration and you have to roll and so forth, does that in any way provide an opportunity for sophisticated traders to to take rent or am I oversimplifying sort of the, the situation? So originally when the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index came out, and this is back like in the early 2000s, you would have people always starting these rumors. Oh, look, price is going to go down. It's the Goldman roll. They roll in the last three days. And, and there would be talk like that. So there, there is kind of a stigma about people being able to front run this and do something, but there's so much liquidity and so much trading that takes place in the underlying. And there are so many different ways that you can express your views on this, that I think the market kind of has equalized itself out. So just like we talked about the gas, natural gas and the flows into those ETFs, there are ETFs that are leveraged and will bet on the price going down. 
and they'll do it, you know, in a ratio of like two or three X. So because of the proliferation of all these kind of different products that you have right now, I think it kind of balances out. And then there are other things that you can do, and, and probably Preston and JC could talk about this uh, better than I can, in terms of construction on the index. There are things that you can do that you can smooth out the rolling period and do things to kind of lessen the impact of somebody trying to, let's just say, front run or, or, or take advantage of you doing the rolls without expressing a real view. Yeah, that's right. And, and uh, index providers have, have taken a few different tacks to try to address this. And and liquidity, obviously, you know, being uh, the kind of key driver behind all of that. And we've mentioned that you kind of, you know, from a methodology point of view, you gauge, you know, your your role with the contracts and the index with actually what's going on in in that with those contracts on the trading side. And in general, what you do is you phase in the role between one contract and the next uh, contract. So, uh, in, you know, Tim mentioned three days, uh, in some cases, five days, uh, we have uh, our broadest indices uh, do 15 days. So, you know, there, there's a range of ways to do that. They're going back to pros and cons. Uh, you know, I think you could argue that uh, either way. But the idea is to, to not necessarily have all of that buy and sell pressure on, on one day. Um, I, I think just about all index providers uh, for commodity futures will spread that over a number of days. And, and and that is exactly what you're trying to do, just to make that whole process smoother. So you're not concentrating all of that, uh, all of those flows on, on just one day. Along with all the other things that Tim and Preston have mentioned in terms of the effect on the underlying market, I think most importantly is that we remember that these indices roll several days, if not weeks, before the contract has an expiration. So most typical investors or hedgers, investment vehicles out there in the market tend to have exposure around settlement. That's when the price truly becomes the future value, et cetera. That's where you have price matching. And so by having these index rolls several days, weeks ahead of time, in the case, the rare case that there was some effect slightly up or down on the underlying commodity, it's well out of the price by the time we actually get to expiration of the underlying commodity. And since JC pinned something onto and pressed them, I'll pin something onto the end of JC. Uh, a lot of these financial products, they'll give you some leeway on what you can do with respect to the index. So for instance, one thing would be on an ETF, they've got a technique called representative sampling. So if you're doing something that rolls over a 15 day period, the representative sampling will allow you to compress that or extend that or roll into correlative products if you think that there's a liquidity event or something where the price doesn't really represent fair value. So while the index has hard and fast rules, most of the products, even though they're passively or actively linked to this, will give you flexibility to adjust for the exact phenomenon that you're talking about with people trying to front run this. Right. OK, so we've absolved the indexes of that particular impact. OK, so thanks for that. So, OK, one, JC, turn to you. You know, and, and and sort of the build up in this conversation is obviously one notable absence from any of these indexes has been power. And if we think about the fact that these indexes were originally created just to track uh, against the, the CPI, we've, we've got, I don't know when these episodes are going to go out, but we've got a series of episodes coming on to just the the scale, the, the exponential demand for power over the next 10 years as things like cloud computing expands and particularly AI and all this stuff. I mean, it's going to be quite a shock. Why is power absent? And or in other words, why has why has Tim and team worked on developing a power index? You know, why is that to date been absent from indexes? That's a great question. And really, you have to take a look at the history of the power futures market or any sort of electricity commoditization efforts over the last uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, the first attempt to create a standard contract for broad investment uh, was in the late 90s. Uh, of course, the commercial power generators out in the world, whether in the United States or, or global, were already doing some basic hedging via bilateral contracts with their counterparties. But really, in the late 90s and early 2000s, we started to see swaps develop around these contracts where people could truly hedge their risk. In the early 2000s, the idea of central clearing of these swaps was really coming to the forefront. As we proceed through the 2000s and more and more people are investing in electricity, building new generation 
as the growth electricity demand, both domestically and globally, we hit the financial crisis, um, unrelated to commodities, but a total global financial crisis. And the outset of that was Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank meant that it made more sense for things like natural gas swaps, electricity swaps, oil swaps to become futures. And so power futures began trading in earnest uh, around October of 2012. And for the first time, we're really truly on the radar of some of the largest investment vehicles and less investment firms. While economically, they're the same as swaps, because they were futures, people saw them as more reliable, more robust, more liquid, more transparent, all of those things. So we don't need to debate that. The bottom line is that's the perception. There were some early attempts at some power indices right around that time. None of them were successful. I think that speaks to index construct and perhaps timing. As you have mentioned and Tim has mentioned, Preston has mentioned, what we understand now is when we look at these commodity indices, they are largely lacking exposure to the one thing that all of us use every single day, no matter what. When we turn the light switch on, we expect the lights to come on. We can go a couple of days without driving our car. We don't necessarily need natural gas, but electricity is just a basic consumer good that we have to have. And it's probably the largest commodity, the largest energy commodity, certainly, that doesn't have exposure in traditional indices. And so when we think about electricity and, and how to invest in it, the idea of an ETF is really interesting to the average person. The one reason that electricity futures are not a great viable retail product, frankly, is the size. The notional size of an electricity contract can be very risky to the average investor. It's seen as very, very volatile. And building an index that makes the product more accessible, mutes the volatility to some extent, but still provides a adequate vehicle for total investment. So essentially, in part, you know, the, there are now the tools available to be able to build something like this. And also you, it's sort of meeting the zeitgeist of uh, what people's investors' expectations that power is so, sort of ultimately the, the ultimate energy unit of the future you know however it gets made okay so so tim you've you you have been at the lead of creating this the ice us carbon neutral power index going back to and using the framework we discussed earlier of you know what are what are investors expectations what are they trying to achieve can you just talk to that you know what is this going to solve and achieve for these investors before we talk about its actual construction Sure. So what this does is it this gives you exposure to what is arguably on a retail notional basis, the most consumed commodity in the U.S. And there's nothing else out there right now that represents this. There's no ETF, no mutual fund, no index, no nothing. So it creates exposure to that. And then, you know, we'll let uh, Preston and JC talk about the actual construction. But what the construction does is it mimics um, something that's a little bit less volatile than what the underlying usually is because it spreads it out among different regions and different tenors. And then it also combines in a, in a really unique way uh, carbon offsets to make sure that the overall carbon footprint of the index is zero. And so you've got some investors that are saying, wow, this is great. I, you know, I hear zero carbon. I'm a big ESG fan. This, this works for me. And you have other investors say, look, I just want exposure to the asset class. I understand what this is now. This makes sense. This gives me a way to express a certain amount of my portfolio and put this to work on something that hasn't been available before. Great. Okay. Preston, do you want to talk to, I guess, you know, what is actually in this index? Yeah, sure. I, I think um, what was really interesting when, when you know, Tim and CIC team brought the idea to us, it, it really... We, we had to start with thinking about, you know, it's core index construction principles, right? It's, it, we've got a, a, something that hasn't really been indexed effectively uh, before. How are we going to do this? What is the most effective way to put this into a rigorous index methodology? So we went back to, to first principles. It's very much the way that you would normally think about it. Um, it's, how do you qualify the contracts for inclusion? So, and in this case, it's, uh, you know, it, this is a, a, a very unique segment 
while we fell back to first principles, we had to educate ourselves about how the market worked. And that's uh, where JC's team came in and, uh, and Tim had to done, done a lot of work there. So there's a, a dizzying array of, of electricity futures contracts out there. So the first thing was, you know, how do you narrow it down? What are we going to focus on? What are the basic qualification criteria? And so we decided we we're going to focus on uh, peak hour contracts. They're, they're peak and off peak and all kinds of varieties uh, of contracts, you know, the, the, including the many ones that were, were mentioned previously. So we're focused on, on peak hour electricity contracts. So we came up with uh, a basic liquidity threshold that would allow those contracts to be qualified into the index. And we, we are going to then, that will determine which hubs are going to be represented. So remember, um, the, an electricity futures contract in the U.S. is associated with a, a power hub. So uh, that might be uh, Texas, it might be California, or certain regions in the, in the Northeast or Mid-Atlantic. So um, we are going to then pick one contract, the most liquid peak hour contract associated with each of those uh, hubs. So then that will give you both the contracts and the hubs that are represented. And then you get back to the weighting problem again. So how are you going to weight this? Well, we came up with a very elegant solution here. It's, and it's, it dovetails very nicely with how um, all commodity indexes are typically uh, put together. We're looking at the production. Uh, it's essentially a production value model. How much uh, peak power is being generated um, by each of these uh, hubs? And we're looking at that, uh, smoothing it out over a three-year period, and that is rebalanced annually. So the, the relative weights uh, will translate into the, to the contract weights. Now, the final thing is the role. So we talked a little bit about, you know, choosing which contracts go in. And that the assumption in most commodity in indexes has been, well, you just pick one uh, expiry. And then you then roll that expiry as it as it gets closer to to the date of expiration. Now, in this case, we chose a different approach. Uh, we chose a a strip of futures contracts. So, in this case, twelve months. So the index will hold twelve different expiries. And the reason that we did that, and now Tim and JC can chime in, but this is the nature of the electricity market. We wanted to capture uh, the, both the depth and the breadth of that market and all of the, uh, the, the dynamics associated with it. So as one, the shortest contract rolls off, then we are going to then roll that into the longest contract. So you're gonna take the shortest one and then go out a year and, uh, and roll into that, that longest one. And so it just keeps dynamically rolling on a monthly basis as the shortest one uh, comes out, uh, we roll into the, the longest one. By doing that, you're capturing the full dynamic of the, the roll down process, the, the nature of the curve itself to get the capture the, the roll yield, uh, as we would call it. But also, it tends to alleviate some of the short term spot related volatility that is inherent in the electricity market. Yeah, to, to further to further that volatility, just kind of give you an example, the, the the prompt, the rolling prompt month PJM contract, just the front contract, the hundred day realized volatility right now is about two hundred percent. But if you take a look at the index, the way Preston described it, the one hundred day realized volatility on that is only about thirty percent right now. Okay, so uh, zooming back out, who do you think is going to invest in this, Tim? Like what what problem is this going to solve or what opportunity is this going to unlock for all of those investors you meant earlier on, whether it's pension funds, hedge funds, you know, et cetera? Yeah, so the, the bulk of the interest is going to be coming from pensions and endowments and uh, the family offices in terms of like just day one allocation to this. And we expect them to do the allocation that they've done to typical commodities. So if you've got x percent in a, in a broad commodity index we expect them to reduce that and put this in there in a certain weight and we expect the hedge funds to come in and play in this whether it's to express a view in the underlying or if it's just to try to arb out different pieces of this so that's kind of the, the, the primary group on this and then we also think that you're going to get some interest from we'll say model portfolios that want to allocate into this 
And the, the problem that this solves for them, again, would be you're getting exposure to an asset class because electricity makes up like directly about 2.5% 2, 2 of the CPI in and of itself. And then if you take a look at how much impact electricity has indirectly, well, it's it's in almost everything we touch, like Preston and JC had said. So if you want to get yourself some exposure to that on a, on a direct and indirect basis, that's how you do it. And also, too, if you want to express a view on the underlying, because again, as we try to take the U.S. from you know, right now about 45 percent, or I'm sorry, 35 percent renewable right now, probably up to like the, the targets of, you know, 85 to 100 percent. This gives you a way to express that, too. OK, just to stay on that underlying there, because, of course, in that run up to renewables, the expectation in some part is the variable cost of power is going to drop. Right. So how does that play into how you then express that with this index? Well, I, I, I think that's a speculative viewpoint, Paul. Certainly, we can <laughs> sure. look at a lot of examples recently and make some broad decisions about whether or not renewables make power cheaper or not. We also have to qualify what do we mean by cheaper. For instance, we could look at uh, wind power in the state of Texas. Texas is the largest wind producer in the United States. There are certainly times when wind is wonderful to have as a part of the portfolio for power generation, it does great things to green up, if you will. It reduces the amount of necessary natural gas. But it's arguable that wind is not economic to build. Once it's built, once it's a sunk cost, once it's a part of the fleet, then it certainly is great to have. Those paybacks and economics are getting better and better all the time. And so more recently, the uh, economics have been better to build wind. And it's likely that with improving technologies, that will continue to be true. Certainly, solar has some very similar questions attached to it. Uh, it's expensive to build. You have to have a lot of land. You need a lot of transmission. So is it arguably cheaper? Not necessarily, but it's arguably cleaner, I suppose. Even that has been brought into debate recently when you start to look at the components necessary to build windmills or uh, solar panels, photovoltaic voltaic arrays, a lot of different chemicals and rare earth metals that go into there. And we could get down a rabbit hole. However, I think if we look at URI or if we look at that's winter storm URI here in Texas, or even if you look at uh, what's going on in Europe, being a green only fleet of production relying solely on wind or solar has problems it can be cloudy the wind doesn't blow having a good portfolio just like an investor makes sense so when we look at electricity production there are certainly those that would call for a hundred percent renewable the problem with most renewables is they have an intermittency problem meaning it's not always sunny, it's not always windy. How do I produce when it's not there? So a lot of people will point out that we do have batteries. And it's true, we do have some very small, relatively speaking, batteries today. 10 years, 20 years, maybe batteries solve the problem, but we're not there yet. So having a very diverse portfolio of energy production makes sense. Given that, the other fuel costs are largely natural gas. Certainly when you get to the extremes and you simply need every available megawatt, you have to reconsider coal, you have to reconsider diesel generators, you have to reconsider hamsters at that point. Things can get more expensive at the margins. And that's really what we saw during her winter storm Yuri, excuse me, is we didn't have all the available renewables we needed. Certainly some of the gas that was needed was not available for a wide variety of reasons. It made electricity very expensive. So one of the things is that this index can capture those types of movements, which are very important to capturing the broader CPI. Those are very real inputs. Those are very real costs that everybody in Texas had to deal with then, may have some repercussions mm, now. Mm, mm. Similarly, if we look at Europe, we can say it's wonderful to have very green, environmentally friendly, carbon friendly policies. The reality of it is we need natural gas. 
And when their primary source of natural gas became very difficult to obtain, more expensive to obtain, the price of electricity went through the roof. That has spawned all sorts of other investments, new contracts, new shipping, liquefaction of gas, sending it to Europe. There are lots of other economic kickoffs, but the bottom line is from an inflationary perspective, electricity is a hugely meaningful piece and is probably not going to zero anytime soon. And even if it does approach zero, there are likely to be significant periods of times where the price is very volatile and very non-zero simply because we can't control random changes, random acts of war, Covered, Climate. covered it, covered extensively on this uh, with the European power crisis episodes, and, and obviously, you know, covering all sides of the energy transition and the volatility that introduces. Um, so, I've got a couple of questions left before we wrap up. Uh, one is, I think it's going to be sound a very stupid question, but I think it points to my the complexity of the subject. Just so I understand, right? So, would you know you have these large power price shocks, you know? goes up to how many thousands of dollars a megawatt hour etc does this index would it actually capture that value and store that value for you yeah the index is on a 12 month strip and it's a long only index so you will have exposure to that front month contract now you're going to be rolling during the the, the roll period but you'll have exposure to that front month piece so you'll get some of that plus if you have those giant price spikes like jc was talking about during winter storm yuri and you have you know nine thousand dollars pegged it in ERCOT, that's going to propagate throughout the rest of the curve because if you can go up to nine thousand dollars an hour and you actually see that for a few weeks then the rest of the curve probably looks undervalued from a relative basis and so the rest of the curve will get lifted up also so as a long only index you do absolutely get to participate in those up moves especially because of the asymmetric nature of those prices one thing i would um, i would i would add on the index construction side that, that also plays into what uh, both Tim and, and JC were just talking about is, um, you know, the, the carbon neutral uh, angle uh, of the methodology. So, we, you know, we are uh, actually looking at, at the EPA uh, data on how, what is the carbon uh, emissions associated with the generation uh, that's represented in the index. And then buying the, the carbon allowances in the U.S. carbon allowance uh, futures market to offset that. So, as that changes, then that share of the index will, you know, go up or go down. There is certainly a, uh, a an aim in the current administration to to get to uh, zero um, emissions and generation, but you know that, that's not necessarily going to be a straight or easy easy path. And this index will not only represent the the broad U.S. power market, but also uh, on the with on the carbon neutral basis. The value of those uh, those carbon allowances necessary to offset uh, the emissions. Okay, great. So then I'm going to turn back to you, Tim, on this one because you've obviously spent a lot of time in the merchant market and and, and building trading teams and so forth. Is power has always been it's sort of commodity trading on hard mode for all those reasons that we mentioned earlier on, and you know, and it's a it is difficult and challenging to build up a, the risk management infrastructure to be able to trade it. Is there a sense that this could start being kind of, you know, a, a gateway drug for these for trading houses, merchants to get into the uh, into into the sector? Yeah, absolutely. We've actually received calls about this product from a number of different groups because they wanted to get exposure to the sector and they didn't know how to do it. So if they wanted to do it previous to uh, the creation of this index, they would need to have all sorts of screens, all sorts of prices, all sorts of different you know, risk systems to do it. And like, for example, with, with crude oil, if you buy you know, one contract crude oil for September or for December, it's still a thousand barrels on the underline. But if you buy PJM June versus PJM December, it's a different amount of underlying hours. And if you buy PJM June versus California June, it's, it's different hours. And so the complexity for the investors that wanted to do something and, and express their view in the power space before this was just difficult because it's just it's not understood. And it's even though it's a commodity, it's not all uniform across the board. And so this gives them a way of expressing their view where it's an average of the different major trading hubs and it's averaged out over the tenors and it takes out some of the volatility on it. So this is the, the initial response 
has been a lot of interest in, in trying to figure out a way to do something with the index. Yeah, the, the, the index in that sense really goes back to what is an index, what purpose does an index serve to begin with? It's uh, So yes, we're tracking the market and, and we believe the methodology in, in, a, in, a, in a very complete way achieves that objective, but it, it also provides transparency to the, the underlying nature of the market through its constituents and how it does what it does. And in terms of performance, uh, we talked about the components, how you can actually look and measure and see uh, what's going on. Whereas before it was, uh, again, you had uh, a complicated specialist market of people in the industry or, or speculators that were only involved. But now uh, you can potentially broaden that by having something you can see, point to and discuss. Excellent. OK, so so I guess wrapping up. Part of this, the backdrop to this is that we're seeing a, a growing recognition of the role of power and all of those things you, you alluded to, JC, that then will go into the infrastructure that enables uh, a decarbonized economy. Um, uh, do we expect to, this to be sort of a one of, you know, essentially we're saying the old commodity indexes, all, you know, ultimately invented 40 years ago, there or thereabouts, you know, are really not reflective of the future suite of commodities that are going to drive the energy transition and we should expect to see and i'm no doubt ice will participate in this you know more indexes coming that are reflective of the key components and commodities of the future yeah paul i i think we certainly would assert that we're not saying necessarily that existing index aren't good and don't serve a purpose but like anything their roles were designed so that they can evolve and make changes. Uh, rebalances are to make changes. But one of the pieces they've been missing for a long time now is electricity. And so, yes, we are fairly confident that this is a, quote, missing piece. This is something that we believe there will be very broad interest in. And we think that ICE in particular is positioned to capture things like this as we look at new and growing indices in, in the coming future. We did a lot of work here at ICE to build futures exchanges. We did a lot of work in partnering and merging with other businesses, just like Preston mentioned, that run indices. We think that we provide a value suite where we can best identify things just like this and say, what is missing? How do we improve the landscape? And with partners like Tim at CNIC, uh, I, I truly am excited for the future and, and w the different products that we can bring to market. Excellent. Well, um, Tim, I'll let you have the final word. And you know, where can we, where can we all find this? And um, you know, it's been a, an interesting discussion, and you know, certainly furthered my knowledge on on commodity indexes. Those guys have done a really good job of taking you know something that I thought was commercial and actually making it usable and something that we think is going to last. So given that, you know, can't really say again because of, you know, SEC requirements, et cetera, but there are things that should be coming to market relatively quickly that will allow people to actually use what we've discussed here today. Excellent. Okay, well, um, I'll put notes in the show notes and uh, thanks, gentlemen, for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us, Paul. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and HC Group, a search and advisory firm dedicated to the commodity markets, visit our website at www.hcgroup.global. There you can find out more about our services and our offices around the world. There you can also find more content from interviews to insight pieces to more podcasts focused on the commodity value chains. Thanks again for listening.